Paediatric osteopaths are often the first practitioners to see babies after they are discharged from hospital. The osteopath therefore needs to be fully proficient in all areas relating to the birth. This video is aimed at giving a comprehensive description of the two most common birth traumas to the skull, caput succedaneum and cephalohematoma. Reviewing the anatomy of the skull will make it easier to understand the differences between caput succedaneum and cephalohematoma in the fetal skull. Surrounding the brain are five layers. The first layer is the pericranium, or the periosteum of the cranial bones. The pericranium is loosely attached to the surface of the bones of the cranium whilst being firmly adherent to the sutures themselves. The second layer is one of loose connective tissue. Emissary veins are veins that connect the venous system outside of the cranium with those inside the cranium. They begin their path in the loose connective tissue and make their way via the cranial bones into the venous sinus. The third layer is a tendinous sheath or an aponeurosis which is attached to the frontalis muscle anteriorly and the occipitalis muscle posteriorly. The fourth layer is a dense layer of subcutaneous tissue attaching firmly to the layer below, the tendinous aponeurosis and the layer above, the skin. It contains the nerves and blood vessels that supply the skin above. The fifth layer is the skin. During labour, moulding takes place. This is when the fetal skull changes shape in order to allow it to exit the birth canal. Even in the most natural of childbirths, a high degree of pressure is put on the cranium by the cervix and the pelvis. In caput succedaneum, the fetal head descends into the maternal pelvis and is pressed against the dilating cervix. One part of the cranium is exposed to the outside, whilst another part of the cranium still remains within the pelvis. The part of the cervix wrapped around the circumference of the cranium acts as a type of tourniquet, preventing venous return of scalp circulation, and as a result, edema forms in the loose connective tissue. Since the venous and lymphatic buildup is within the subcutaneous part of the cranium, it is not restricted to a particular bone and therefore can extend across a number of sutures. It is precisely this finding, a collection of fluid with undefined margins that sits on the cranium across a number of sutures, that helps practitioners differentiate between caput succedaneum and cephalohematoma. Caput succedaneum is considered a benign condition and in actual fact is no more than just the stagnation of fluid within the tissues. Furthermore, it will disappear unnoticed within 24 hours. However, although there are no medical complications as a result of the condition, the osteopath may still find that there are dysfunctions within the membranous tissue. Unlike caput succedaneum, cephalohematoma is an actual rupture of a blood vessel in the subperiosteal layer. This is most likely to occur during traumatic births where the skull has been repeatedly compressed against the maternal pelvis under strong contractions, such as may occur when the skull is large relative to the maternal pelvis when forceps or vacuum extraction is needed. The constant shearing results in hemorrhage of an emissary vein. Rupture of the emissary veins results in a buildup underneath the pericranium. As I mentioned in the introduction, the pericranium or periosteum of the bone is firmly attached to the sutures but loosely attached to the bones of the cranium. This loose attachment allows for a buildup of blood within the bone but is unable to permeate past the sutures. The bleed is therefore confined to the skull bone in which the emissary vein hemorrhages. Since the bleed is subperiosteal but not underneath the bone, the brain is not affected. The bleed is typically slow and takes two to three days to show up. It may not have been visible at all in the hospital. In theory, cephalohematoma can occur across any of the cranial bones. However, it most likely occurs in the parietal bones and double is likely to occur in the parietal bone that absorbs most impact as it slides underneath the maternal subpubic angle, in other words, the right parietal bone. 
Although rare, the most common complications of cephalohematoma are skull fracture, calcification, or anemia, as the blood is diverted out of the circulatory system. Most cases of cephalohematoma are self-limiting and resolve untreated within two to six weeks.